Hey guys, and welcome to episode 9 of the Homebrews of 80 project. In today's episode, we're going to look at writing some code in assembly, and then programming that onto a ROM, and then we're going to run the code from the ROM on the Z80 computer to verify that the main processor is working correctly. Let's do that! So, before I show you what I've done, I thought I'd actually run through the process that we're going to take to complete this, as it can be a little bit confusing at first, especially considering there's not tons of information online that's easily accessible for people who are just getting into this like I am. So, I'm going to talk through what assembly is, how we compile that into machine code, and then what we do with that machine code to get it onto the computer EEPROM. So, what is assembly? Well, assembly is a low-level programming language. In some ways, it can be likened to C in the sense that it's much more hardware-based, so it's a lot more about bits and bytes and interfacing with specific hardware rather than something like Python, which is a lot higher level. However, it's unlike C in the sense that it's actually hardware-specific. So in assembly, you actually perform functions and write commands that are specific to your chipset or processor that you're using. So, for example, you can reference registers that are only available in the Z80. As a result of this, you have to use a compiler for your specific chipset. There are a number of Z80 compilers available online for assembly. The one I use is just in a website web page. So you just upload your code to the web page, then that gets compiled into machine code. So, what is machine code? Well, once the assembly file has been compiled, it's been converted into machine code. A machine code consists of essentially a list of computer operation codes, or opcodes for short. And opcodes are just binary numbers, essentially, that correspond to particular operations that the processor must complete, for example, add or subtract. These operational codes are specific for every computer, hence why you have to use a compiler that co corresponds to your processor. So, for example, the Z80 can use 8-bit and 16-bit opcodes, and the opcode for NOOP on the Z80 is just eight zeros, so the binary number zero. If you apply that number to the data bus and then clock, the Z80 will do nothing. It will NOOP. And this machine code is contained within the computer EEPROM. So this is the actual code that tells the processor what to do, what operations to perform. And in aggregate, that will complete the task that you want to do, such as a counter or a calculator, for example. So, now we've discussed what assembly is and what machine code is, let's talk about the practical process I actually used to write some code and program it onto a ROM and then get the processor to actually execute that code. So, before we can program anything, we have to write the code that the processor is actually going to run. As you can see here, here's the assembly code that I wrote to actually make a simple counter run on the Z80. So all this code does is it keeps adding one to a specific number and then showing that number on the data bus. At the start of any assembly code, we have to declare where the code actually is in memory or where it starts in memory. And that's done by writing org and then a number. Then this code actually defines a variable. So in this case, there's a variable called initial count, which is a byte, and it has a value zero. And as the comment says here, this variable literally stores the initial value to count from. So if I set that to five, then the counter would count up from five rather than counting up from zero. Now then, this is the main loop. So this loop actually increments the value and puts it on the data bus. So the code starts by lowering the value of initial count into the accumulator. The accumulator is essentially sort of the main register within the processor. We'll discuss this more in another video. However, just for now, treat it as like where the computer puts things to do operations on. Then we run into this loop here. So this text here, main loop, is actually sort of what they call a label. So a label is essentially just a sort of pointer for 
for a particular place in the code. After the label, we load the value of the accumulator to memory position zero. If there's anything with brackets around it in assembly, then it refers to that actual memory address rather than the number zero itself. This is a little bit of a cheat because what I'm essentially telling it to do is load the value of the accumulator into memory position zero in the ROM. However, we can't do this because we're talking or communicating with a ROM. So we can't write into that memory. The only reason I've done this is so I can actually just easily display the value on the data bus. After we've done that, we increment the value of the accumulator. A always refers to the accumulator in uh, assembly code. And then we jump to the pointer main loop. And what that actually means is we just execute these three lines of code over and over again continuously. And that's all this code does. It just loads the value onto the data bus, increments the value, and then does that over and over again. So we, we count up from 0 or from 5 or from 10. So now that we've got this code, how do we convert it into a machine code? And then how do we actually program a ROM with it? To convert my assembly code into machine code, I use this online compiler called Zazm. I'll leave a link in the video description so you can actually check this out yourself. Um, I found it really, really great. It was really easy to use. All you have to do is you have to upload your file into source here. So you just click on choose file and then it will bring up a window where you can select your assembly code file. And then you select which processor you're using. So in this case, we're just using a Z80. And then after that, you just click assemble down here at the bottom. And once the file is assembled, it'll give you an option to download it in Intel hex or some other formats. You want to download it in the Intel hex format. So you can actually select here, sorry, Intel hex. And if you download it in Intel hex, then most programmers will actually recognize Intel hex and be able to program your ROM using that format. If not, you can also download it in a binary and some programmers will accept that. So you can see here that this is the contents of our compiled file. So a colon, not nine, not not, etc. It looks a bit like gobbledygook, but actually that's just the ASCII representation of the 8-bit binary numbers that correspond to the opcodes that the processor will actually understand. So you can actually quite easily convert that using these hexadecimal characters here. So each hex character actually corresponds to four bits. So two hex characters is a byte. And that way you can actually calculate what each of these pairs means and what opcodes being executed. So we have our hex file, but we need to get that onto the ROM. And we do that using something like this. This is an EEPROM programmer that was generously lent to me by a friend. You can see here, there's just a ZIF socket on the top and a guide for where you put the EEPROMs. So you just drop an EEPROM in here, you power this up, then the software that goes with it, you load your Intel hex file or your binary into the software, and then you just make sure that the EEPROM is clean and then, or fully wiped, and then you program it with your code or software by clicking program. If you have an electronically erasable EEPROM, then you can actually erase and program that fully using a programmer. However, those can be quite expensive. So if you want a slightly cheaper method and you have an access to a UV box, then you can use what I'm using, which is just EEPROMs. So they're erasable, but you have to use UV light and shine it on the window on the top of the chip to actually erase the contents. So finally, we're at the stage of actually testing our code with our processor so that we can see whether the processor is working or not, or if we have a bug in our code. This is the setup I used to test whether the processor was functioning correctly or not. So I've got the logic analyzer hooked up to the data bus of the computer again, and then I've got my program ROM plugged in to the computer board. 
the code starts at address zero, so it should immediately start to kick in once the processor is booted up. As you can see here, I've also got a bit of electrical tape over the window for the chip, so it's not erased uh, by UV light from the sun or something similar accidentally, because otherwise your code may not work and you may not know why, and that's because it's some of it's accidentally just been erased. So I'm going to show you what the output was from this test and we'll analyze whether or not the process is working correctly. So these are the signals directly taken from the Z80 data bus from the test that I just showed you earlier. As you can see here, it just looks like a lot of squiggles. However, I've used the PulseView software to analyze this in parallel. So it's combining these eight bits into two hexadecimal characters for us. And as we can see, there's actually a recurring pattern appearing across here. So it looks like our code is at least running or something is happening. We can see this repeat pattern of naught, a number 3C18FA32, naught, another number 3C18FA32, naught, another number 3C18FA32. So it looks like what's happening is we've got a command then the number of the counter, then another command, then another command, then another command, then the command, the number of the counter, and so on. However, to truly verify that our code is working, we can actually match some of these command codes to the command codes of the Z80 to make sure that they actually correspond to some of the commands that we used in our assembly code earlier. So let's do that. If we look at 3C, we can see on this list of Z80 commands that that directly corresponds to increment A, which is one of the commands that we used in our assembly code earlier. Also, if we look at FA, we can see that that actually co directly corresponds to a jump command, which is also one of the commands that we used earlier. So that pretty much conclusively verifies that our code is running. And what's more, if we look at this again, we can actually see that this number here is incrementing. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and so on. So we have a working counter. Our processor is functioning correctly, and it's reading the machine code properly. And we could actually, if we wanted to, just stop now and use this as a computer, as a processor. So we could write code in assembly or another language, compile it into machine code for the Z80, and then execute our software accordingly. So in theory now, we could hook the Z80 up to LEDs or dot matrix displays, and we could get it to run those different peripherals for us using assembly code. So this is a really great step forward because it means the majority of our board is working, and we can now move on to troubleshoot the issues with our memory decoding for the RAM and then possibly look at how the serial interface chip is working and whether or not that's working at all. So this is really, really fantastic news. We have a partially working board that's run some assembly code for us and we can start to see light at the end of the tunnel. So now we need to continue our troubleshooting so we can potentially get the basic interpreter code running on the Z80 board. But this is really fantastic news. We're making some real progress now. Thank you very much, guys, for watching. I'll see you in the next episode. Please look for links in the description for the key pieces of information in this video or more information on those. And also follow me on Twitter if you want more frequent updates. I'm at Tim Maxwell. And as always, like the video if you like this video. Dislike it if you didn't. And if you like to keep up with my content, please hit the subscribe button. Thanks very much.